Okay, so in this lesson, we are going to look at what's the difference between heat and temperature. They're obviously not exactly the same thing because I know that temperature is measured in degrees Celsius or Kelvin, and you know the heat is always measured in, that's right, either a joule, a calorie, a kilojoule, a kilocalorie. Uh, so they clearly aren't the same thing, but they're very related to each other. And we've got to get to what is that difference. Um, we already know the units of heat and temperature, so the only other thing we're going to do is we're going to use our understanding to be able to calculate the heat absorbed or released by water. In other words, we're building up to a formula here that's going to be central to a lot of what we're doing in this unit. Why so much of a focus on water? Well, we are going to apply these calculations to things other than water. But if you think about it, our goal here is not just to see how, you know, sort of hot things transfer their heat to colder things. We're really after that idea of how to calculate free energy. In other, in other words, how to let heat flow help us predict uh, if a reaction will work well, if it will work spontaneously. Because there's nothing more frustrating than doing reactions in lab that don't work. And a lot of our reactions are going to happen in water. They're aqueous solutions. And so the, the calculations we do here are laying the groundwork for our reactions work a little bit later. Okay, so let's get to this. So heat is not the same as temperature. And I want you to make a prediction here. I've got these two beakers, um, a big one and a small one. Uh, even went through the effort of putting a little cardboard on top for a little insulation. Um, but they are, they are spaced pretty evenly on this one burner. And I'm about to turn on this one burner. I want you to make a prediction which one of these two, if they're on the same burner, we're hoping that they're gonna absorb the same amount of heat, which one of them will have a bigger change in temperature. Well, let's let it go and see what happens, but I think I can already see what's going on. Um, definitely, if you said beaker B, the smaller one, is going to have a bigger change in temperature given the same amount of heat absorbed, you are absolutely right. Uh, and that kind of indicates that heat and temperature are not the same. Well, for instance, temperature has all of its colorful letters and heat for some reason has a black T, but that's not the only thing that makes them different. Uh, so in any case, yes, there's a bigger change in temperature given the same amount of heat. We believe that the stove provided similar amounts of heat to these, to these bits of water. They're absorbing the heat, so it should be positive. But we saw a bigger change in temperature with the smaller one. Well, why is that? Well, the belief is that there are just more particles in this beaker, and we know that as they absorb that heat, they will start wiggling faster, and that will cause the temperature to go up. But in the smaller beaker, instead of maybe 50 particles, maybe there's only 10, then if they're absorbing the same amount of heat, those 10 particles have to absorb all that heat themselves, and you'll see a bigger change in temperature. I like to think of it as kind of like, whoop, let me show you. I like to think of it kind of like this. If you give a bowl of candy to one kid, man, they're going to get so excited, they're going to be shaking because they're just, you know, absorbing so much sugar. But if you take the same bowl of candy and, and give it to three kids, well, they're not going to get quite as hyper because they're distributing those calories, that energy, over the three of them. Same idea with these beakers of water. Here's another example that kind of indicates that, uh, that uh, temperature and heat are not the same thing. Like, look at these two pools. If they were both at 80 degrees Celsius on a summer day, and then you left them out at night and it cooled down way down, let's say it cooled down to 30 degrees Celsius, which one of these two would see the bigger change in temperature overnight? Well, definitely the smaller one would be because if they're losing heat at the same rate, um, but this one is having to give up that heat from less particles, it should see a bigger change in temperature. So I'm betting when you jump back in the big one in the next morning, it will seem warmer. All right, so let's see. So if we... Uh, we didn't need that warm-up. Uh, so if we kind of get this idea uh, that uh, the heat and temperature aren't the same thing, we're going to use that to develop a formula so that we can calculate the heat absorbed or released by water. We'll deal with metals and other things later. So this is not the formula, but it's getting us to think about this idea that we know that in some way an amount of material has to be in there. So hence the M. The M stands for mass, and we have that in grams. Q obviously stands for heat, and it must be in joules, and you'll see why in just a second. 
the temperature is not just the temperature, right? We said as it absorbed heat, it didn't have a temperature. It had a change in temperature. So when you're doing change in temperature, it's important to know the change in temperature is always the final temperature minus the initial, right? And you may know this about science. That's always true, right? You have change in velocity. It's always the final velocity minus the initial velocity. Always final minus initial. Uh, what's C though? Let's get to what C is. Well, C is a constant. Um, and if we're using water, then that value is always going to be 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. When we get to other substances, it will be a different value. And it's something you have to get from a table. But what it's saying is, if you want to increase the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius, it's going to take you about four joules of energy. So we're going to have this. It's something you might want to write down because, like I said, it's it's not a random number. It's going to show up an awful lot in what we're doing. It is on the AP equation sheet, uh, but you're going to you're going to need it for web assign and things like that. So we're going to practice some calculations with this, but I, I want to bring up one thing which you may run into here, which is this the heat capacity here. You can see that I'm using C for that abbreviation. Occasionally you will see S used there. In this formula, occasionally you'll see S. AP always uses C. Now there's a reason for it. Heat capacity and specific heat capacity means slightly different things. You can imagine that you could have the, the amounts in different units. Like you could have joules per mole degree Celsius. If instead of you know saying we've got 100 grams of water, we could convert it to moles and use a, specific, a heat capacity that is uh, in moles. Well, if you say specific heat capacity and you use S, you mean joules per gram degree Celsius. You're talking about always for one gram. Specific heat capacity means for one gram. If you use any other kind of heat capacity, like one that has moles in it, then you're just going to use heat capacity. Um, and sometimes you, you're not even saying specifically for any amount. If you're just talking about just for some uh, known amount, you may just use joules per degree Celsius. But my point being is all these other units are going to depend very much on what the unit is for C. And so you got to look very, very carefully at it. One other aside here, of course, I told you you could look all of these up. Let me erase all the ink on the slide. But if the heat capacity of water is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius, if you wanted to know what the heat capacity was in terms of moles, you could just convert it. For water, there's 18.02 grams per one mole. That would cancel our grams. And if I do 4.184 times 18, I would get the number of uh, joules that are needed per mole of water. So you can always look this up, the, the value, but it's pretty easy to convert anyway. All right, now that's a little bit of an aside. Let's get to what we're after here today. Let's practice this. So you'll see, let me, I'm gonna get rid of me here. Um, you'll see that when we were heating up the, that beaker A, it had an initial temperature and a final temperature. And what I want you to do is use those values and calculate the amount of heat that's being used here. And I'm gonna suggest we have about 210 milliliters of water. So let's say we have 210 grams of water since the density is one gram per mil. All right, if it's 210 grams, calculate how much heat was absorbed by beaker A. Okay, well, here's what I got. I said it was 210 grams, we used 4.184, I did final minus initial, so 53 minus 17, and I got 31,191 joules. Not worried about sig figs at the moment, but you remember if we did sig figs when we subtract these two, we'd get it still be to the tenths place, and I think that would still give us three sig figs. I don't think it gets down to two. Um, that we're guessing a little bit, let's say two sig figs. So we should probably cut this off at two sig figs, which means I might want to call this 31 kilojoules, right? If I kind of quickly convert it from joules to kilojoules, um, because there's a thousand joules in a kilojoule. So that might be a good way to say it, but always final minus initial. And if you do that correctly, the sign comes out positive. Let's see if that makes sense. Well, we were talking about the heat that the water was absorbing. It was going from the stove, the hot stove, right, into the beaker, which was colder. And so, yes, Q here should be positive. Is it endo or exothermic? 
Definitely endothermic from the water's perspective, right? Easy peasy. Let's try another one. Uh, not that one. I don't want to do that one. Okay, let's try this one. So I'll let you read it, and what I want you to do is I want you to calculate how many grams of water were in the cup. All right, there are a couple of tricks here, and these are meant to uh, exemplify things you should watch out for when you're working on problems, including WebAssign and AP problems. The first one is, did you catch that this unit was, uh, this unit was a little bit off? Uh, so we're probably going to need to convert that to, um, to joules. So I'm going to say 5,000 joules. But there's another trick. Um, we need to pay attention to the heat. Very often they require us to put the sign on it. Well, it is losing five kilojoules of heat as it cools down. In other words, the cup is hot, the air is colder, the cup is, is cooling down, so the, the heat is going out. Q is going to be negative. So we're going to say negative 5,000 joules of heat. So that's the first trick. The second is, remember, we got to get final minus initial. Well, this was the final temperature, and that was the initial. So we're going to subtract those two. Okay, let's see what it looks like. So there's our negative 5,000 joules. We have 28 minus 38, which gives us negative 10. When we divide the negative 10, you see how the negative goes away, which is good because we can't have negative grams. And I got 120 grams-ish. I'm being pretty lax on the, on the sig figs because I only had one here. So you might really say 100 grams. But you get the point. So yes, you. here's tip number one uh, of, of problem solving here. You will often have to make a decision about the sign. They aren't going to say whether it's positive or negative. You have to make a decision about the sign. So knowing that, let's try the next one. And it's our last one. So I'll let you read it. I want you to calculate what was the final temperature of the water. Now there are actually two subtle tricks here. So I want you to see if you can anticipate what those are. And then calculate the answer. Okay, what were the two tricks? Well, not the energy. Remember that, that uh, heat capacity is in joules, so I think we're okay there. Uh, maybe the sign, let's think about the sign. They, it looks like her stove is heating up the water. So I think the water is cold, the, the, um, the flame is hot, and I think the heat is going into the water. Q should be positive, so that wasn't a trick. I think that's fine. Um, oh, here, units. We need our units here in grams, right? So let's see, one, two, three, I'm gonna say 400 grams. Um, this temperature is an initial temperature. And of course, the last trick is they said, what was the final temperature? So solving for delta T is not gonna be enough. We're gonna have to add it to our initial temperature to figure out the answer. So here's my work, I had positive there, I solved for delta T, I got 4.9 degrees Celsius. So clearly based on adding that much energy, she hadn't been doing this very long. But that's the change in temperature and we've got to add it to 15 to get our final temperature. So it went from 15 degrees up to 19.9. Okay, so those are kind of the things that you need to watch out for as you use uh, what I like to fondly call QMCAT. Um, that's what, those are the tricks that you need to watch out for. Now, what we're going to be using this for going forward is applying it to reactions and measuring how much heat reactions give off. Uh, but before we get to that, in our next lesson, we're going to look at the specific heat of things other than water.